Good afternoon, everyone. This is Darius Dale here, senior analyst on the Hedge Eye Macro team. Got some home cooking for you guys uh, this afternoon. I'm joined in the studio with Hedge Eye CEO Keith McCullough, and uh, he and I will discuss uh, what we believe to be our unmistakable signs of a U.S. economic slowdown, which obviously the Fed agrees with. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have pivoted. <laughs> it's nice. It's nice. It's they, nice that they agree. They, yeah. they triply agree with that. Triply agree. <laughs> they, the I think they agree more than we do now. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, and we we spent a lot of time in the last three days just going through a lot of the causal factors. We spent you know different points in time talking about people and their process. We've added the contextual um, information or the contextual intelligence, like somebody like Danielle that we just had on, who actually worked at the Fed. There's so much that you need to do to even start playing this game at a high level. And again, we're not God's gift to the game, but we're certainly ready, willing, and going to help you play the game at the highest level that you possibly can. Uh, having a specific view on where the actual numbers are uh, is critical to the process. So again, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that, do the U.S. economy, and then we can come back to uh, some of our international views a little later on. But first, just want to surgically get into that process and how we have the views that we have, why we have conviction when we have it, and why the Fed, by the way, agrees with us or has a central tendency to agree with us on a three to six month lag. So we're constantly not fighting the Fed, Front running the Fed, which is a much better place to be when you're when you're when you're trying to make and save some money. Uh, so first, if, if the team goes to slide six, uh, for those of you that don't know what the four quadrant measuring and mapping process is, uh, it's also called our GIP model. Growth, inflation, and policy are the two things uh, that we're trying to front run. The P, or the G, the G and the I are rather. If you look at this, uh, it, it looks a little it looks a little bit busy, uh, but at the end of the day, it really isn't. Uh, math can be busy, and we're not trying to. Um, you know, make the game simple like people on Wall Street have over the years with you. They've given you these simple shortcuts that really don't work, like a 50-day a moving average or a 200-day moving monkey. That's a simple thing. You can click a button and, yeah, you, you understand it. But what, does it really help you? Of course it does not. So what we're trying to do is A-B test not only where our own proprietary market signal is, which is based on price, volume, and volatility, but where the economy is and measure and map that daily with a real-time nowcast. So again, we have four quadrants in the setup. You have two factors, growth and inflation. Uh, when, growth and in, when growth is accelerating and, uh, and, growth is, and inflation are accelerating at the same time, you go to quad two. So quad one and quad two are where you have growth accelerating. Okay? One has more inflation, one has less. Uh, when everything slows, like it did in the fourth quarter, you end up with a fourth quadrant outlook. So again, both the rates of change of inflation slow and growth slow at the same time, then the Fed freaks out because asset prices really don't like that. It's commonly called disinflation or deflation. Once the Fed sees quad four, it tries to push markets into quad three. So what they predominantly do that through is through the commodity markets and asset markets. So what they're trying to do is get people to believe that asset prices can't go down because they're actually going up. So again, you should believe that. You should get long a quad three portfolio. Not long the concept that the U.S. economy is back to here, growth accelerating, but you have more of a stagflating or a stagnating U.S. economy where the things that you as investors get paid to own are the things that other people have to eat in terms of cost of living or put in their car in the case of gas prices. Okay, so again, the economic outlook and the actual asset classes that you want to own and the specific sector pivots that you want to make. If you guys go to slide eight, uh, obviously our power users uh, understand this, but since many of you are, are, are trialing this, or actually this is a free one. So uh, again, uh, welcome to, to, to our process. Again, our process is not only predictable uh, and rules-based, but again, it's repeatable. So again, once you go from quad four, quad four is the death knell. Uh, effectively, you go from being long in quad two, by the way, we're in, in quad one and two for two and a half years. Where your top three things that you should be long from a style factor perspective are momentum, growth, and high beta. That would equate to the sectors that you know, which include tech and consumer discretionary in particular. When you go to quad four, so when you take a fly over here, now those are the things that you want to be short, okay? You want to be short tech, energy, and industrials. You want to be short momentum, high beta, and growth, okay? So this is the call that we made on September the 27th that after two and a half years of being in A and B here, positive growth, growth was about to slow, you wanna get out of all those things and start buying the things that you didn't own for the two and a half years prior, which include long-term bonds, gold, uh, and the sectors that are bond proxies, which include consumer staples and REITs. Uh, REITs has been one of our uh, most favorite. I shouldn't have circled that in red, but you get the point. Okay, so the Fed sees that, and then they say, just like I said, okay, we gotta cut interest rates, we got to cut, 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 triple, dovish, I go. Okay? What happens? Interest rates go down, treasury yields go up. 
No, that's not what happens. Treasury bonds go up. Treasury yields are going down. And all the sectors that like that, including utilities and REITs and energy, go straight up. So again, those are the top three sectors that we like because we currently have the U.S. economy in quad three for the next three quarters. Okay? Pretty simple. The biggest underweight we have in the equity sector is financials. So what happened yesterday when the Fed went dovish, again, third time in less than three months, what happened? Energy stocks led the rally, followed closely by utilities and REITs. Financials led the decliners. On the open this morning, financials led the decliners, and you continue to see a rally in the things that we're telling you to buy. This is not magic. This is a process. I understand that we don't nail every single day of every single month. But again, what we're trying to do is get the intermediate to long-term calls right within the, within the lens of the economic cycle. The economic cycle, if you go back to slide five, is simply on a sine curve. Where are you in rate of change terms? Okay, so in rate of change terms, it's pretty simple where we are today. We're on this part of the curve. That's called growth slowing. When, when you're on this part of the curve, it's called Yay. growth accelerating. That's for two and a half years, Darius, right? Yay. Two and a half years. Just awesome, all right? So again, the most important thing in macro is to get this point right and this point right and understand they're not tops and, uh, tops and bottoms, they're processes. So again, they're things that you can measure and map daily. Certainly with our help, we're gonna help you do that. But that's all that we're trying to tell you here is that there's pretty much uh, a mathematical certainty at this point that the economy is slowing because even the Federal Reserve knows that. Okay, uh, important points indeed. Okay, so we have Nowcast for all these things. Slide uh, uh, 13, guys, if you just jump ahead. Uh, that's based on everything, including the most recent economic data points, which would include uh, the most recent slowdown in retail sales numbers, for example. Uh, so again, the cycle peak, once again, where was the cycle peak? Right here, pin the tail on the docky. Then all of a sudden you get a, you get a slowdown from here to here to here to here. So we have the US economy slowing throughout the rest of the year. That's why we have it in quad three. We also have inflation going from peak cycle to starting to go up again. That's on slide, uh, slide 50. So again, our call was that inflation right here peaked and that bond yields were going to stop going up because inflation was gonna stop going up. It indeed did. You got over 100 basis points of a drop in headline inflation. Now Powell can say, I don't see any inflation looking at headline inflation. Thanks for coming out. And the bond <laughs> king completely missed that. You know, there are people that are very powerful in this industry with big reputations that completely got that wrong, all right? So again, we're not trying to tell you we're smarter than everybody else. We're just telling you that we have a process that you can understand. So again, every month, inflation data was gonna come out. We know that. And if it came out lower the next month and the month after that, then bond yields, the number one correlation of the long end of the bond curve, again, in terms of yields, is the rate of change of inflation. Okay, so that happened too. By the way, if you want to know what uh, we think the GDP now cast is for headline GDP, which is different than the year over year, we use the year over year to get into the, the headline, which is a quarter over quarter seasonally annualized number that everybody looks at, which is not that useful. Uh, but again, we have gone from 4% to 3% to 2% to one, we're at 1.2% for the coming quarter. Okay, so that's um, just something to keep in the back of your minds is that the next data point in the economy is actually going to, this will be reported, I think, in the, the beginning of April, right, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, at the beginning yeah. of April, because now the government's not shut down, you're actually going to get this data on time. And the data point will be that the Fed is actually doing what they th thought they should be doing. When GDP goes from four to three to two and a half to mm -hmm. one, then they should be going dovish. Now, the next thing is, when are they going to cut interest rates? We just had that discussion with Danielle. Uh, I think it's closer to when earnings start slowing at a faster rate, which is also starting once companies start coming out in April. Uh, the bank stocks are gonna see dramatic declines in terms of year-over-year -year earnings growth in particular. And again, that's another way to think about why bank stocks would go down. You would buy a bank stock when you're in quad two, inflation and growth are accelerating, and, and the banks are guiding to higher growth rates and earnings. Once those growth rates have peaked and growth and inflation start to fall, what would you do with the bank stocks? So again, now you're starting to understand how you would tie back what you already understand fundamentally to a macro view, okay? A macro view that is, again, updated daily. If you have questions on this, of course, uh, please ask them. We have no problem spending a lot of time on the process. The process matters more than anything else. And again, the process doesn't submit that you're gonna get every single market move right and everything right for the right reason. 
Again, we're, we're getting a lot of these economic moves right, and to get the market right on top of that is very difficult. Uh, but again, we're trying our best to get it, uh, or at least get the big moves right. And again, not trying to apologize for every single mistake that we make. And unlike many people, we uh, make mistakes out in the open. Everything's timestamped, so you can obviously see those in real time uh, as well. If you jump ahead, uh, maybe Darius, you can, maybe if you want to take people through uh, the base effect mm -hmm. um, and, and how that works as having predictive value, I think that yeah. that should be... Um, should be probably explained when we go from quad four to quad three. Yes. Uh, I think uh, we start, probably, that yeah, start on slide 27. 27. Yeah. yeah, so the U.S. economy is coming off of a record 10 quarter acceleration in year-over-year -year real GDP growth. I mean, you can pull the data all the way back to as far as we can get in. We've never seen such a contiguous run of improving economic conditions in the U.S., which was great and fine and dandy and perpetuated all-time highs in risk assets in, in the late summer. But now that's our comparative base. Um, so as we progress throughout 2019, what's more than likely to happen is that as we start to see nascent signs of deceleration off the cycle peak, which is where we currently are, the probability that we continue to slow through the back half of the year as the comparative base gets tougher and tougher and tougher um, actually is, is quite high. And so, you know, the model back tests quite high uh, with a 73% probability that growth slows in these forecast periods um, when the base effects deepen um, and vice versa, growth tends to accelerate. Um, when base effects are receding by the same degree and, and magnitude. Yeah, these are the base effects, just so you can see the, the bars here on this chart, the gray bars are the base effects. Mm -hmm. They're, think of it like a mountain, okay? Oh, so if you're going, uh, you know, if you started at, uh, let's say you're at the base of a mountain, you're at 1,500 feet, then you go up a little bit, you're at 3,000 feet. By the time you get over here, you're gonna be at 10 to 15,000 feet. Mm -hmm. If you ever climbed, uh, uh, you, you would note that you probably slow down if you kept the same pace, again, unless you upped your uh, metabolic rate. Yes. Okay, so again, the, the whole concept of base effects is that the, the mountain is getting steeper, mm -hmm. and that works the other way around. Once you get over the top of the mountain, again, um, the base effects here were easing. That should be a green light, but again, these are easing, okay? So as the base effects, these bars here, are going lower, the pace of the acceleration went faster. Mm -hmm. Again. Hedge Eye is as bearish on the growth cycle today as we were bullish back then. There's, we're not biased, we're not political, you know, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat. I'm just telling you what the rate of change of the numbers are doing, and you back, uh, basically back and fill on that every single day. Maybe that's another, I think it's slide 30 is probably a good chart for you yeah. to show people on that. Yeah, and, I, and just before we even go there, I just sort of summarize, you know, we use a lot of nomenclature here and jargon and, and just sort of contextualize and color what we're, we're discussing internally with all this, these quantitative signals. But the easiest way to think about base effects is just mean reversion. Economies and financial markets tend to be sinusoidal. Um, they're not GDP and CPI. These are very non-stationary time series. So what you tend to see is that you know, they mean revert around some normalized level of growth and or inflation. And it's our job as investors, or at least our job as macro investors, is to identify those most probable points of mean reversion along those curves. Yep, absolutely. Um, questions in the queue, keep bringing them. <laughs> One was, what subscriber level gets you that slide deck that you keep showing? Uh, 16000 bucks a quarter uh, for institutions. So Minimum. again, this is a premium product that we built the firm 90% at one point of our revenues were at the highest level of institutions, the most sophisticated ones that were willing to pay out of their pocket for this information, and now that's starting to broaden. We're well north of 300 institutions now paying for that. Uh, but what we're trying to do with these, the macro show, all the daily products, is give you pieces uh, of that process and, again, get you to the point. I mean, if you want to get fully uh, immersed in the process, there's a price for that. Uh, we do these quarterly decks quarterly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I tend to think of it like this. I mean, someone trading their PA or their retirement accounts probably wants to know the conclusions and the investment solutions um, associated with right. the process. Someone trading institutional assets probably wants to know the why and how the soup's made so they can have more comfort with, you know, associated with their career risk, associated right. with their making Absolutely. these decisions. And if you need a validation, not that you would, you could just see the results, but I mean, uh, of our calls at the turns, acceleration to deceleration and all the market calls within the call, which is much more important than calling the Dow bro. Um, you know, you would, just, you would just ask our clients. I mean, no independent research firm in macro has moved up the institutional investor ranks like we have in the last 10 years, not even close. Uh, all we're doing is taking share from the old wall and the survivors of that old wall, and that survivorship uh, is becoming an interesting case study as well. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. Maybe go to slide 30. Yeah, so let's get back, getting back to the data. So, you know, effectively... You know, what we do is we run a predictive tracking algorithm for not only the U.S. economy, but for, for every economy, investable economy, 
Um, that combines a series of, of high frequency indicators, both on the soft side of the economy with respect to surveys, and also on the hard side of the economy with respect to you know, consumption, manufacturing, export data, and the like. And what we do is combine all of those into a proprietary now casting formula to determine what the output for GDP or for CPI are likely to be. What Keith is highlighting here on slide 30 at the top 10 factors, the, the, the model actually is dynamically reweighted according to the amount of information that it contributes um, to the marginal rate of change of GDP or CPI, um, not to get too sort of technical on that. But what we're showing here is the top 10 factors heading into 4Q. And what we saw is that in each of these factors in, in 4Q18, decelerated off their respective cycle peak, which was largely 3Q18 for each of them. So it was very easy for us to sort of pick up on this deceleration in real time and, and which was confirming of our initial forecast that growth would decelerate as a function of base effects starting to steepen off their, their, their sort of 3Q18 bottom. And so that's, that's kind of the point, whereas, you know, if you're, if you're looking to allocate assets because the Fed is pivoting dovishly, like they did in the early part of 16, you think about where you are on these side curves with respect to very, very critical parts of the economy. I mean, we're not, you know, retail sales is not 24% of GDP, you know, something like manufacturing, which is about a third of the economy. You know, the, these things were bottoming out and hollowing with, with respect to their own respective sign curves in the early part of 16, whereas the Fed is pivoting dovishly very, very close right off the, the initial slowdown off the cycle peak. So we're at a very different state, which is why the markets continue to trade much more like quad three as opposed to quads one or two, which is where we've been. Yeah, quads one course. and two, I was just, uh, while Darius is speaking, I'm showing you what it does. It's color coded. So again, it's really red when it's at its lowest point, and it's really green when it's at its max point, okay? Mm -hmm. So again, that's the whole point. When something goes from a green light to a yellow light, what do you do? Some people speed up, like the Fed did. They tightened into the slowdown. Nice job, okay? <laughs> uh, or some people bought stocks on the first dip, the second dip, and then they had Santa's out, tell them that in December, we're going to have the biggest Santa Claus rally that we never had. We had the worst December in the history of Decembers which even Santa Sout would agree is a very long time. Okay, so that's about the only thing that the old wall agrees with us on. Uh, but again, us going bullish back in here, because again, you're gonna go from bright red to amber to yellow to eventually the market was discounting. This should be a, a green, this should be a green line. Mm -hmm. But eventually the market was discounting going towards the absolute and, and, and unequivocal green, okay? The market's constantly discounting where you're going, not where you came from. Okay, so our forward outlook, as you can see, is going from yellow light to amber light to some red lights. So the closer you get to the really red lights, oh boy, look at that. What do you think this one's going to be? I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to circle it. What do you think this is going to be? What do you think is the most red thing that you could find? Oh, is it called transports? Oh, look at that. <laughs> FedEx, what the heck? Fed? FedEx, FedEx can't take red, price? Red, red, <laughs> Okay, so the problem is, and that, and that can explain, you know, the game within the game if you're just looking at, well, why is the Russell and the financials and the transports look dramatically different than energy stocks or something that the Fed is now reflating, okay? So, or bond yields and bond proxies. Like, why do they all look different? It's because the cycle has it right. The market has the cycle right. So again, that's the point. Um, there's, no, there's no irony that uh, there are bearish breakdowns across the transports would include airline stocks. And I'm not just talking about Boeing. That's obviously its own situation. But don't forget that Boeing is a pro-cyclical stock too. It does great at the end of an economic rally. People have a lot of CapEx orders because they're flush with cash flows, okay? So we have that, we have FedEx, we have Southwest Airlines, you can pick it. They're basically discounting that the next three quarters, their numbers are gonna be really bad, mm -hmm. okay? So that's the way you apply this to the sector level. And again, you bring that back to where I was on slide eight in terms of picking the right sectors to be in and most importantly, the ones to get out of. That's probably the most important thing in your 401k is when to get out. Nobody on Wall Street gives you that call. Uh, you probably have to pay two and 20 to some macro hedge fund who hasn't made money for 10 years, and they didn't do it for you either. So again, you wanna get this thing and, and understand why we're using it. It's trying to help you make uh, moves so that you don't lose a lot of money when everybody else is. Yeah, well, I mean, you just go to slides 33 and 34. You know, FedEx is obviously this global bellwether, um, indicative of, of demand in the, not only the domestic, but the global manufacturing mm. economy. You know, these are the cycle peak growth rates that they were, were rolling off of from a Sinco perspective. I'll say two things about this. One, it was a heck of a run from three, you know, from the early part of sixteen to the the, the you know mid two thousand eighteen. Heck of a run! Wow, heck of a run! I mean, that's a an enormous swing in, in in basis points of acceleration terms. <laughs> two, that's now our comp, and so you know the, you got the microchip semi guy. You know, at least the FedEx guy is honest, right? You know, he's saying 
you know, we probably haven't seen the bottom after one quarter of slowing. Yeah. You, know, you have some of these other CEOs and CFOs that are probably, you know, looking to buy or be sold or be acquired that, that probably have a different, uh, different, different song to sing at the current juncture. But our models continue to suggest that we're likely to decelerate across some of these very key parts of the economy at the bare minimum through the middle of this year, potentially well into the fourth quarter. Um, this is industrial production, exports is on the next slide. All these charts effectively look the same because, you know, the, U, the parts of the U.S. economy, you heard that the phrase globally synchronized recovery. Yep. Well, the U.S. economy itself had a very cohesive sort of synchronized recovery if you think about both the manufacturing side of the house and also the consumption side of the house accelerating concomitantly from 2016 all the way through the cycle peaks in 2018. And so now that both of those things are rolling off their cycle peak, it all but ensures that we're going to see a pretty big downshift um, and domestic economic growth. Yeah, what happened was here too is that the U.S. chugged along. So the globally synchronized recovery ended right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the U.S. kept going last chugging. year, kept chugging away. So again, if you look at that, maybe we should show them slide 39 because mm -hmm. yeah, that's absolutely. kind of, a, and we're going to get a lot of questions now. Mm -hmm. um, but slide 39 takes all of the global economy. In this case, we're just showing the top 20 countries by GDP, and we're again scoring them quads one, two, three, and four. Quads one and two are green because they're good for growth. Quads three and four are bad, yellow lights, red lights. So as you can see on this, you know, again, this is why we make the calls that we made. In Q1 of 18, Hedgeye says, okay, that's from a global perspective, that's Q1 18, the world is a four. But do you see how the USA was not a four? See this, this critter right in here, the USA, which is the second row from the bottom? The US went 10 quarters in a row of uh, effectively quads one and two, okay? All the way out here. It outran the rest of the world for three more quarters, mm -hmm. okay? So the U.S. was the place to be, and that's why we were bullish on U.S. growth all the way up until September the 27th. We're making sales throughout the early part of September in real-time alerts, of, of course, anyway. Uh, but you can see that it's not atypical for the world to diverge or disconnect from the U.S. Now, in the first quarter of 2019, which the Fed understands, the whole world, including the U.S., is in a four. Okay, that's your economic um, setup right there. And now the U.S. we have a quad three for three quarters in a row. Okay, so again, uh, we're constantly measuring and mapping these colors and change with the numbers. It's not an opinion. Like I don't call like Larry Kudlow and say, "Hey, Larry, how's the economy feel?" You and Donald. Oh, no, 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 no. Feeling great. Yeah, what, what we want to do <laughs> is calibrate. You know, again. Some, some people uh, like my style, some people don't like my style. I don't particularly care if they love me or don't like me. I'm not trying to be loved or not loved. What I'm trying to do is be apolitical and vigorously data dependent. Uh, and that's what our, what our team is doing each and every day. Um, and we color it up with cartoons. And yes, we have themes. And yes, we tweet. Because we like, we're humans. We like to have fun. Like, you know, we went to good schools, but I wouldn't spend all my time in the weenie bin. I'd go have a couple beers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd go have some fun. You know, so we I have some fun house. with this uh, because macro should be fun. And it's especially fun when you're not losing a bunch of money when everybody else is. Okay. Um, so maybe we should. Yeah, um, I got a couple questions. Or there's a couple questions in the queue I think yeah. are appropriate. Oh, you have the queue. Uh, like, thank, thankfully. Now you get the queue. I've had the queue for like three days. I know, man. It's People cute. go bananas in this it's, queue. It's hard to keep up with the queue. We oh, appreciate it. Mo. You guys have fantastic questions, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I'll say this. We learn a lot just from difficult questions. You know, a lot of times, the, the right answer, which we talked about um, a couple of days ago on the macro show, the right answer is, I don't know. Yeah. And sometimes you just got to go back and do the dang work. Yeah. Uh, and lo and behold, you know, a lot of these guys on, uh, on the Octobox, you know, they'll, they'll tell you, they'll be 100% sure with no accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> with 0% accuracy. So yeah. uh, we're, we're not going to give that to By you. By the way, on these questions, um, I'm going to answer a lot of the questions with two things, because those are the two things that matter. We're A, B testing this. Mm -hmm. I just went through A. The GIP month, where is growth and inflation? Measure, map that every single day across countries. The other one is the signal. Okay, the market signal is constantly trying to front run that economic data, don't forget. Uh, that's slide 20, so I'll talk about the immediate term trade of the market, the trend for the market, which is three months or more, and then the long-term tail risk, which is inside of three years. Um, so again, when you ask a question, please ask about the duration. If you're asking just for day trades, I'm happy to try to answer that question. Uh, but where we really make our bacon, and we've made the firm um, you know, really for the last decade, is on these trends. Because mm -hmm. trends, three months or more, they can last. In this case, we think quad three lasts, as I pointed out. It's easy to remember, quad three for three quarters. And again, in market space, that's a long time. Indeed. Awesome. Here, uh, our buddy Junkie is, uh, is asking, uh, would you guys be able to review 
uh, what happened in the junk bond space the last time we were in a growth slowing environment since it's been so long. Yeah, go to slide uh, 71. You guys can see, uh, you can, you can, I can answer that question using credit spreads, okay? Mm -hmm. Credit spreads, uh, they widen. For those of you that don't know what that means, I'm gonna give you a quick tutorial on that. And since we do have, you know, we do have the, this is a, a webcast, it's free. I don't want to in insult anybody's intelligence, but at the same time, I, I, we're finding a lot of value in teaching people, particularly people with, uh, that have made a lot of money that don't want to lose their money. They want to learn how to do this properly. So education is a big component of what we do. Credit spreads widening is when junk bonds go down. They go down a lot, okay? Especially when they widen a lot and stay wide. What you'll see is that credit spreads, which are um, you know, moving up this way in this case, well, I'll actually show it with some the right color. But again, if credit spreads are going up, that's bad. And I'll, I'll just quickly add, for those of you who may not know, credit spreads is, is the spread between the, the interest rate on a junk bond or, or corporate credit instrument relative to U.S. Treasuries on, yep. a, on a duration adjusted basis. So how much are you willing to pay relative to what is ultra safe, which mm -hmm. is a treasury. Exactly. So if you have to pay more, that means that people are getting more concerned. Mm -hmm. If you pay less, which happens 100% of the time when the economy is accelerated and everybody thinks it's perfect and it's never gonna go away from perfect, i.e. quads one and two, US growth, hashtag accelerating. What ends up happening, uh, the water is nice and warm, come on in, it's no problem. Uh, in the periods of the, the, as many of you guys will recall, the 1990s, for example, credit spreads were not a problem. From 1993 to 1999, the U.S. economy averaged, uh, again, over 4% real GDP growth. Again, coming out of this 2016 lows to here, obviously the same thing, credit spreads are low. Credit spreads are low from 04 through 07. So again, these are economic expansions. Credit spreads widen when? When you have a red bar. You know, 1991 recession, 2001, 2008, great financial crisis. So again, we've actually had systematically, we've had some short-term and episodic non-trending, non-trending breakouts and credit spreads, which we did include uh, when oil went to 30 last time. So that was back in 2016. This is why the Fed and the, um, and, and, uh, the Chinese Central Bank, by the way, had to provide what is commonly called the Shanghai Accord. That's because credit spreads were right there. So they're constantly fighting gravity, gravity being the cycle. The cycle is where is growth and inflation going and where are earnings going in kind. When earnings start to go slow and then go to negative, credit spreads widen, okay? So that's what uh, you wanna be thinking about with, with the junk bond market. If there's one live quote that you should have on your screen every day, and please, you know, God willing, CNBC will never figure this very basic thing out. It's like not having your speedometer on in a car. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, have high yield spreads on your dashboard, please. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, um, you, you kind of alluded to this, but the next question here from TK is, can you walk through the earnings recession and how you get to that, specifically the EBIT margin scenario analysis? Yeah, go to slide 64, mm -hmm. uh, if you guys could. First of all, to get an earnings recession, you have to have an earnings expansion. So again, going back to my buddy Bob Schiller, which we were talking about uh, in the prior uh, session of the summit with, with Danielle. You know, the thing Bob, Bob ta taught me and taught Darius is mean reversion. Okay? Mean reversion means what goes up must come down. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, when the earnings uh, peaked here, it went down. When the earnings peaked here, it went down. These are called the recessionary periods. That's why the bars are red. Um, so now, don't worry about it, and this is not an optical illusion, but the S&P 500 earnings level is at the all-time high after scaling to the highest point of a mountain at the fastest pace ever. Yeah, that's not a good comment. So that's reason number one why earnings are going down. You can't go any higher. Okay, that's a factual statement. You cannot go any higher, okay? Point number two, if you look at the margin of the S&P 500, which is another way to look at this, the next slide, uh, the S&P 500, which many of you will know if you run a company what, the, what your EBIT margin is or your profit margin um, uh, before interest and taxes. Okay, so that's for the S&P 500, the EBIT margin. Again, not surprisingly, in the, you know, you could barely see the OO recession, by the way, and you could have lost uh, well, well more than half your money. If you were in credit, you would have lost a lot more than that. Uh, again, but you'll see that EBIT margins, where do they peak? They peak at the peak of an economic cycle. And again, we, you had this 2016. You know, again, this is because you had all the resources companies blow up, and you're right back there again. Never in U.S. history, and I like to remember the words never and ever, because they actually mean something, okay? It has nothing to do with what your reform brokers are telling you, how they feel, what kind of jokes they're telling you on Twitter. Never ever in the history of S&P 500 EBIT margins have you eclipsed this level. 
So why would it be different this time? With U.S. labor, which is one of the main components of that, rising at a faster rate. Okay, and we already know that earnings are declining, so that's the point. Uh, if you go ahead to uh, slide, um, I, I believe it's slide 69, guys. We'll show that the S&P 500 earnings uh, currently is, actually go to the next one, where the S&P 500 earnings peak. This is why we're coloring it up in red. These are your peak comparisons for the economic cycle. So in other words, the growth rate, when I was showing you at the peak of the mountain, how they're peaking up into that level. And, and guess what? As stock market bulls back then, and particularly bulls of the NASDAQ, bulls of growth stocks, and bears of all the things we like now, which are bond proxies, that was the point. If you bought stocks knowing that growth was going to perpetuate faster earnings, you wouldn't have cared that these stocks were expensive using too low of an earnings number. Now you're getting sucked into believing that the stock market is cheap using a number that's too high. Mm -hmm. And as the number comes down, the stock looks more expensive. You see how that works? FedEx is more expensive today after it went down than it was a month ago, okay? Because the earnings are going down now, okay? Because the company has to report reality. So Wall Street today, um, still, by the time you get to the fourth quarter, don't worry. They think earnings are going to be up, up about 8%. Okay? Classic Wall Street yeah, hockey cl stick. Classic, classic, classic. And by the way, these numbers, um, you know, these numbers used to be double-digit earnings expectations. So after that hit, poopy poopy in the pal pants, a couple dovish pivots, and then all of a sudden every you know, CFO in America is taking down their numbers. Oh, but it's a one-off. Or is it the cycle? The cycle as in the one you never warned us on before it started to slow. So again, as you can see, uh, the, the earnings slowdown case is much easier to see, much easier to see than what spies are gonna do today, tomorrow, or next week, mm -hmm. all right? Much easier to get the intermediate term call on earnings slowing right, and how that should and always has, unless it's different this time, it's never happened before, where earnings go negative and credit spreads don't widen and junk bonds don't have a problem. Yeah, and there's one more thing I would add, um, or at least two more things I would add, just going back to the even margin point. Um, if you go to slide 45 um, and 46, we just sort of talk about two factors that we see colliding to perpetuate a degradation in even margin. So oh, that's factor, a good point. factor number one, 45, is the dollar. Um, so we have the U.S. dollar index on a quarterly average basis, tracking up 8% year over year in Q1, here in Q119. If you go back to Q118, it was down 7%. So when you think about you know, going back to that export chart on 34, you don't have to go there. But the U.S. was able to continue showing growth in its manufacturing and export sector, largely as a function of those circles that Keith is highlighting. And we were able to continue perpetuating this record round of accelerating GDP growth, despite the rest of the global economy really starting to show um, degradation from, from off their respective cycle peaks. Now that's the exact opposite scenario. Now that this dollar, this dollar impact is going to translate from an from a overseas uh, sales and, e and operating margin perspective back into the flow through to, to S&P 500 earnings. So that's something that's headwind number one yep. to operating margins. But headwind number two, which has always been the case late cycle, was on slide 46. And this is one of the scarier charts in macro, if, if not the scariest, or at least at the bare minimum it alludes to the scariest because it op opens up a whole can of political worms that, that really won't come back out, that won't go back into the can. Um, what we're showing here on this chart is the propensity for wages to accelerate and stay sticky and high and trend at these levels th from now through the end of the cycle. So on the left chart, what we're showing is our proxy for labor market tightness um, by showing the spread between the U6 underemployment rate relative to the U3 unemployment rate. Um, what that effectively means is that spread continues to narrow and narrows to its cycle tight. It effectively means we're running out of dry powder in terms of the available workers per job opening um, to hire. So as a function of that reduced supply, what you tend to have to see is, is an increase in price for labor. Um, and what you see is historically when we've breached levels that we're currently at um, as of February, 350 basis points wide between these two indicators, uh, we've historically seen the fastest rates of wage growth in, any, in, in and across cycles. So it's no shock to us that wage growth accelerated to a new cycle high of 3.4% in February of 19. The employment cost index continues to make new cycle highs, highest level since 06. These are headlines that investors are going to have to continually get used to from now until whenever the next recession begins. Yep. You know, you, the Fed can cut rates, but it can't cut labor, as you <laughs> exactly. like to say. Now, um, I, I, and I'm drawing what Darius is saying with green arrows. You are the people, unless you are a corporate. By this point of the presentation, you're completely disgusted with me and probably don't like me because you cannot afford to believe the facts that I've just laid out, that they're probable, okay? Now, if you're a human being and you get paid more, that should be good. 
If you're a human being that's getting paid more and more and more, and so are all your friends, everyone you go out for lunch with, dinner with, hang out with, friends, that you, even your non-friends, you're kind of happy for them. They're all getting paid more. It's great, right? Until Good. the company's revenue slow and you're getting paid too much, their margins come down and then you get fired. Okay. That is the only way you can cut labor, which is, by the way, 100% of the time what happens is that labor increases into the peak of the cycle and perpetuates the downside of the next cycle. I think we have that in slide, slide 66 Slide sixty six in this deck. The biggest problem politically in this country is a real one. And that's a problem that's going to come home to roost for corporates is that they've been feeding on low labor for quite some time. In fact, you can make the argument that they've been feeding on low labor uh, for about 20 years. Okay. So in this chart, we're showing effectively labor against profits. Pretty basic. Uh, you can go to an econ 101 class at a community college and they'll tell you uh, that the relationship between these two factors is probably an important thing to consider. Uh, if not, no. And again, uh, if you want to be good at macro, these are known knowns. Okay, They're known knowns. Ignorance is not an acceptable thing to uh, have as part of your DNA. Uh, a lot of brokers have this problem because they have no, you know, you know what idea. No idea, right? But they're going to tell you everything about Tesla. Okay. They're, they have no idea. No idea on the economic cycle. Some of them do. Some of them pay us a lot of money so that they do. That's what you pay for. You pay for awareness as opposed to being ignorant. But everyone who does it at the highest level, it's like putting on your equipment. It's a given. You know that at the peak of every other economic cycle, the, the gray line was high and rising. I'm going to use green because, again, the people were getting paid. People are getting paid. Yeah. But again, what happens when the people get paid too much is that you end up with a recession. Because, again, uh, apologies for that. Um, uh, what, what ends up happening are these red bars. So again, you get recessions here because corporate profits are going here. Oh, the companies aren't getting paid, so they fire you. Notice that uh, at, up until most recently, 100% of the time, the corporates would see their margin drop from a high level to right around this level. It's always at this level. Even in the great financial crisis, oh, wow, look at that, random. No, went to the same level. Corporate profit peak, they mean revert, slow, go to the lows. Now you got labor down here. You know, the people have been plowed. This gray line's been plowed. Plowed right into the bloody sand. That's why Trump gets elected. That's why Bernie makes you interested. That's why, because the people got pounded and the corporates got paid, okay? Mm -hmm. It's fine. I'm a capitalist, deal with it. Find a place where people are getting paid, okay? But again, that's not, I'm not you know, your, your political 101 consensus. At least 50% of people don't like that. And 100% of the people that are getting pounded don't like that. So again, <laughs> what's going to happen here is that, again, we're going to have a green moment where Lazarus starts rising, which is the people, and labor is going to go up. And what does the black line do when the labor line goes up? It comes down. So we know it's going to come down. What we don't know is how fast. What we're trying to tell you is that the most logical point for it to go down faster is that when it has to compare against the steepest point of that mountain that, again, I showed you on slide 64. Indeed. Indeed. All right, let's, uh, let's shift the discussion sort of back to investment implications as well. Mm -hmm. um, Ed's acting, asking, uh, what's more attractive from here, the, the short end of the curve or the long end of the curve, assuming rate cuts are coming? I think the short end is where I have uh, the most. I've owned treasuries across the curve going back to when we went bullish on treasuries or bearish on growth back uh, at the end of September. Um, so again, I think the biggest move from here is probably going to come in the short end of the curve, because if I'm right, and earnings go negative year over year, and credit spreads widen, poopy poopy in the pal pants is going to be a polite way to put the alliteration. All right, He's going to have to get aggressive and cut the short end of the rate down. All right? It's probably one of the easiest calls that I've made in my career. 20 years now, these obviously only come around once every cycle. Um, but it's easier now because I'm less dumb than I used to be. I used to be as ignorant as most of you are uh, that feel ignorant a little bit ignorant now. I feel ignorant every time I read a book. You, you learn, right? I just finished reading this one. This is leadership in turbulent times. Yeah, we're going to have some turbulent times. We're going to need some leadership. But this is where Doris Kearns Goodwin goes through uh, the genuine leadership in moments of adversity. And that's, that's what we're going to need here. Uh, and, and Powell's only real move in terms of providing Federal Reserve leadership is going to be trying to provide cowbell. And eventually people are going to start to get scared because they're going to realize that he's scared for a reason. Yeah. And, and, and when people hear that, they freak out. Oh, my God, how could you buy stocks? 
It's like, well, you can actually buy stocks until you don't have to buy stocks, and we would just not really talk about it that way. We'd buy the sectors that Thank we like. You. It's the sectors and the style factors. Right. No one is paying us to make calls on the SPY. Nobody gets paid <laughs> to make calls on the SPY. You want to find out? Look at the, 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 look at the fee and expense ratios on index mutual funds. That should tell you everything you need to know about why you should not take your eyes off navel gazing at the Dow. What is the asset management fee and performance fee on the SPY? I'm guessing it's probably six basis points, if I had to guess. Yep. That's out of nowhere. That's but. not worth anybody's time. Yeah. You know what's worth <laughs> people's time is not losing 20% of your money in a straight line or more between October and December and blaming everything other than the process itself and the cycle. Okay, so that's that's where you earn your earn your keep. Mm -hmm. All right, six and question. Yep, yep. And then just lastly on on fixed income, because we talked about uh, the short end of the curve versus the long end of the curve, one place where you're more than likely to see perhaps even a better bet from a risk-adjusted perspective is putting on a treasury steepener. Um, because the, the next path is for the Fed to cut rates. You can make the case that, at least historically, the 10s 2 spread hasn't typically gone much lower from here. Um, like 20 right, or 30 basis points. Yeah, yeah, 78, uh, but so it's slide 78. Um, so it appears that this Fed is, much, is, is more or less hell-bent on getting out ahead of this and preventing a, a, what, we, what, has, what has historically been a deep, interest, or deep uh, yield curve inversion on the order of 20 to 30 basis points. Yep. So if we don't see that, the most likely outcome from here is the curve will start to steepen. But again, steepening into a slowdown is not this signal that a US, uh, U.S. economic acceleration is on the way. It's not a signal for investors to run out and buy their favorite regional bank stock. In fact, it's the Fed corroborating exactly what the, the factors that we continue to outline yeah. for the U.S. economy. There's a good question here about this uh, Powell dynamics uh, from Dave, Dave Sebastian. Uh, with the mm -hmm. Powell, with, with, I like how he calls him the Powell. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Powell backing away from QT yesterday, why did high yield rally even the acknowledgement that earnings will slow? Uh, when will markets uh, price this in or pick this up? Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually quite typical that when the Fed provides, again, you guys got gains <laughs> on right when the Fed goes like this, what do you do with bonds? Like, what do you, any bond? I mean, when the Fed goes like this, do you sell bonds? No, you buy bonds, okay? So what happens in high yield is that it picks up the same bid that every other bond is picking up. People are just clamoring. Again, lower yields equal higher bond prices. That's very short term. So if you're ringing this bell and, you're, and, I, and you got money on the line, uh, I'm, I got Yale right now against LSU, this bell may have to, this bell may be useless in, in T minus how many minutes, guys? Give me an update on that game. But again, it ends when it ends. The game ends. Notice how the cowbell, Powell's gone three times. That's why I call it triple dovish. Fourth time, fifth time. You know how many times Bernanke tried to go incrementally dovish in 08? Every incremental time as earnings started to go negative became a very bad thing. Okay, so this is, again, it's hard for people to believe until they believe it, and this is why when we were making the call originally in September, the Russell 2000, by the way, is still down about 12% from there, uh, which is pretty broad base. Uh, basket of stocks. Uh, and if you're down 12, you've got to be up 13 to get back to break even. Um, so again, nobody believed us in September. And I'm certain that if the spies are up when you're asking the question, you may not believe it now. But that's not how you manage risk. Risk happens slowly, and then it happens all at once. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of the summary of slide 72 here in the deck. Uh, we show you know, the progression of credit spreads with respect to the economic cycle. Great chart. Uh, this is, yeah, so this what we're, uh, it takes a second to explain this chart. But what we're showing here on the x-axis on the chart, the horizontal axis, is the Treasury Bond Market Volatility Index, a.k.a. the move. Um, we're showing that as a proxy for you know, the, the Fed's range of probable outcomes um, sort of really starting to broaden and expand as investors start to price in various economic scenarios, i.e. not a uniform acceleration. Um, what we're showing on the y-axis, the vertical axis, is high yield credit spreads, which is the chart we had previously showed, um, and then the size of the bubble, which is the average annual um, the, each bubble represents the average annual uh, sort of um, level for each of those, but the size of the bubble is calibrated for the amount of corporate credit outstanding as a ratio of the economy. So you've heard many, many sort of pundits, and we've even um, come out sort of highlighting this fact. But you know, there's effectively when you add in CLOs and, and other instruments, there's effectively nine trillion of U.S. corporate credit outstanding. That's more than a double of where we were heading into the last economic downturn. Um, and a third of that is triple B rated or lower. Mm -hmm. So we've never seen this amount of credit outstanding with the worst sort of composition in terms of its, its credit market dynamics at the sort of worst possible point on this chart from yeah. the economic perspective uh -huh. heading into an earnings recession. So it's going to be very interesting as we progress throughout 2019 to see how credit markets react with such 
you know, how very illiquid credit markets react to these dynamics because, again, they haven't been reported yet. You know, this, this view that the U.S. economy is going to go into a multi-year deceleration or multi-quarter deceleration and a multi-quarter earnings recession is still speculation from our behalf. Yeah. To the extent that it starts to become reality then on a training basis, the then it will start so to matter. So think of this like, uh, first of all, this chart always moves from here when everything's fine mm -hmm. out this way. Mm -hmm. I don't it's know if any, like, I try to come up with new metaphors because we have people, of course, that have paid us for 10 years and it's uninteresting for me to repeat the same thing over and over again, so I try to make it interesting with a new metaphor. Now, if any of you guys have gone cliff diving, uh, you know, where you stand, particularly have, if you have a couple tequilas, you're standing somewhere in Cabo, you're standing here, right? You're standing right on the cliff. And you're looking down and you're like, well, I see a lot of people jumping in there. That looks pretty safe. Um, Meanwhile, a couple other locals start saying there's a tornado that started developing or a hurricane that started developing off the coast. Uh, sir, we should go inside. No, I want to stay static in my assumption. I want to still consider making this jump. Regardless of any massive tailwind that's just about to jack me from, the, from behind and make me go over this much quicker than I would have liked to. Okay, so the conditional factors are the weather. Think of it that way. They're changing dynamically every day. The wind, the rain, you can measure and map it. Our job really isn't to tell you that we're going to get Hurricane Harvey or whatever hurricane you want to list on this day, on April 27th. It's to actually just warn you that the prevailing conditions are you're standing over a cliff, and you've never done this before, but get ready. All right? That's why I'm using the tequila example. Not mm -hmm. many people in Fairfield, Connecticut, stand over a 200-foot cliff with a bunch of rocks underneath it and think that it's a good idea. Okay? This is the corporate credit market right now. Okay? There's the most credit in the history of U.S. corporate credit. That's a risky thing when spreads start to widen. In other words, when the credit spread go, this goes up, these dots start to go up. Pretty simple thing to visualize now, isn't it? Now, why is it that none of your brokers or no investment bank have ever explained that very basic concept to you? So they get paid fees to sell it to you. Yeah. Why would, why would we ever communicate that? Now you know the rest of the story. And look, and, and I'll, I'll be very frank, you know. Thinking Hurricane Harvey, Paul Harvey, maybe? Yeah, we're probably starting to scare some people, so, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll dial it back a little That's bit. That's all right. I'd like to get it. I'd like to get it going once more. <laughs> yeah, no, look, it's just, if we did this webcast two years ago, or even a year ago. We'd be trying to scare we, you that how good things would be. scare you how good things would be. <laughs> you know, it's all about measuring and mapping the rate of change of the cycle. Where are you on the sign curve? It just so happens that today, March 21st, 2019, we're at a very precarious point on that sign curve. You know, March 21st, 2018, certainly of 17, and, and probably the mid-2016 when the economy bottomed, we're a very good part of that sign curve where we can actually have multiple quarters and, in fact, multiple years of acceleration and yep. credit spreads tightening and staying tight. Mm -hmm. Well, that's no longer the case if you consider the fact that, or at least consider our forecast that the economy is going to decelerate and we're going to have an earnings recession. Yeah, exactly. You know when the best time, by the way, to go back to, because I'll be, we're, we're the first uh, firm, uh, independent research firm, to, to call the crash in 2008 but then go bullish in April of 2009. Mm -hmm. So again, back to our nice, uh, nice, beautiful spot in Cabo. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody, after that hit in 08, you could have bought any place, any part post-hurricane, immediately after that hurricane, right about the moment where you thought it would never get better again, for such little money, relatively speaking, to what you would have had to pay for it at the peak. That's the moment when everyone's prepared gets to invest for real. All right? So we've done it. We've done it many times. We've built this firm in those, uh, in, in those and during those conditions. So again, there's always going to be a really bullish point in time. It's never at the peak of an economic cycle. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, that's pretty much it for the U.S. questions. Um, do you have any parting thoughts? Or? Um, mm, I don't know about parting thoughts. Parting thoughts, no. Yeah. What's the meaning? Uh, what, what's the color of those of those bubbles? What's the meaning of that? That's one question, Darius. Oh, the quote. Yeah. So we're just showing um, green Bad is times and good times. Yeah. Green is like <laughs> green is cycle peak. Uh, orange is, you know, you're starting to move off the cycle peak, and obviously red is is an effective downturn. You're you're obviously heading into an economic downturn, and that's being corroborated by both the data, the financial markets, and obviously the Federal Reserve, um, which tends to operate on a lag to both of those. But it looks like they're at the bare minimum. You know, Jay Powell are our uh, potentially, allegedly, politically compromised Federal Reserve Chairman, formerly of private equity, you know, maybe getting some calls from his buddy at the Washington Economics Club saying, hey, man, we're at the wrong side of the sign curve. We need you to do more, buds. I know, <laughs> I know, your, dot, I know your, your summary of economic rejections haven't changed much, yeah. 
But we might need you to uh, you know, help us out a bit, man. You know, we need these fees. Do we got some things to get IPO this year? If there's anything in the prior discussion <laughs> with Danielle that I believe more so than I would have believed without having had the discussion, uh, is that Powell is bought and paid for by private equity. Yeah. Okay, so at the end of the day, he's a political figure. He's a lawyer. Uh, lawyers do what they're told. And, again, it's not a mean thing to say. Uh, it's, it's just a fact. a fact. It's a fact. So at the end of the day, understand that, that w- there would be a moment there where he tries to do the next cut and the market gets more concerned. Again, this has happened before multiple times in my career, and I'm one of the few people that can say with a straight face that I've never missed making the call coming off a cycle peak. And, again, that's an important call to be able to make. You need a process to be able to do that. Again, I'm not trying to say I'm all that. Uh, anyone can tell you when a market's going up and why they think it's going up. Very few people can call the turns with a repeatable process. Cool. Let's see. Uh, we have Liz. I think uh, that's Liz Ann Saunders on Monday. We do have Liz Ann. Uh, so Liz Ann, uh, who's one of the best macro strategists out there. Mm-hmm. I don't use those terms loosely. Uh, if I were to start building a team tomorrow with people that are currently, you know, again, uh, effectively competitors of ours, I'd certainly have her at the top of the list. I'd have a long list of people where I just decayed the interview. Uh, but again, here, this is, this is, she's, she's legit, and uh, I'm looking forward to having her. I think it's going to be Monday at 2 p.m. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, thanks for spending uh, a, good, uh, a good amount of time with us today. We appreciate your audience, and we're looking forward to seeing you again.